And then um, the actors come in and Hamlet says, you are welcome, masters, welcome all. I'm glad to see thee well. Uh, welcome, good friends. And then he recognises some of the actors from when he was in Witt Wittenberg. Um, and he says, oh, my old friend, thy face is valent since I saw thee last. So he's saying, oh, you've grown a beard. And then he says, what, my long, young lady and mistress. So this is a joke because, of course, um, in this time period, it was completely inappropriate for women to be actors. So the, the female parts were all played by younger men whose voices hadn't broken yet. So he says, he, he calls her a lady, but it's really just a young man. So he says, your ladyship is nearer to heaven than when I saw you last. You've grown a lot. Um, your voice, like a piece of current gold, be not cracked within the ring, so I hope your voice hasn't broken yet. Um, and he says, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, give us a speech. He wants to hear um, their, their quality. And so the sort of lead actor or the first player says, what speech do you want me to give? Um, and Hamlet says, hey, I heard, I heard you um, give a speech once. It was a speech from um, Aeneas to Dido, which is another classical illusion. And he says, um, it's a speech about um, King Priam's slaughter. So this is, um, this is an allusion to Troy, um, where um, Priam is killed by Pyrrhus. Um, so then Hamlet has remembered some of this speech in the past, and he says, let me see, the rugged Pyrrhus like the Hyrcanian beast um, no, that's not how it started. It begins with Pyrrhus. The rugged Pyrrhus, he whose sable arms, um, black is his purpose. So you can see that Hamlet has, has memorised this speech. Now, this is an important part because Pyrrhus sort of creates the fourth character who is a son getting revenge for the death of his father. So we have um, Fortinbras, who has raised an army originally in an attempt to get revenge, but who has now sworn, made a vow, that he won't actually go for revenge after all. Um, we have Hamlet, who is in the process now of trying to figure out how he will go about getting revenge and whether it's worth doing. Uh, we're not up to it yet, but Laertes will end up getting revenge for the, the murder of his father. And now we have the classical allusion to the character of Pyrrhus um, and his vengeance on Priam. Um, so you'll see here that um, the rugged Pyrrhus, he whose sable arms, black as his purpose, did the knight resemble. So that just is fancy language um, for Pyrrhus being dressed all in black, which is the same as Hamlet. We've found out that Hamlet has been dressed all in black as well. Um, which leads you to ask why Hamlet particularly wanted this speech to be heard by um, Rosencrantz, Guildenstern himself and Polonius. Um, so basically, in this part of the speech, um, Hamlet sets up the situation where um, Pyrrhus is in the streets of Troy. He's covered over and looking um, like a, something out of hell because he's completely covered in the dried blood of mothers, fathers, um, daughters, sons um, because he's killed so many people in the streets of Troy. Um, and then he's seeking um, Priam in order to get his revenge. Um, Polonius compliments um, Hamlet for his delivery of these lines because he's um, a sycophant and then the first player continues from where Hamlet left off um, and he says anon he finds him striking too short at Greeks so um, Pyrrhus finds Priam um, fighting with the Greeks his antique sword rebellious to his arm lies where it falls repugnant to command um, so um, Priam has dropped his sword because he's exhausted um, unequal match, Pyrrhus at Priam drives, so it's not an equal fight, Pyrrhus is um, armed and Priam isn't, and Pyrrhus um, is, drives, like dives um, at Priam with his sword, but in rage strikes wide, but with the whiff and wind of his fell sword, the unnerved father falls. So um, he's so angry when he sees Priam that even though he's, it's an easy kill because Priam's standing there defenceless, because he's so angry, he strikes wide. He's unable to um, to put in the killing um, killing blow. Um, but the the air that comes off the sword when he swings it through um, is so um, is so strong that it knocks Priam over. Um, so the unnerved father falls. Priam falls over. Um, then senseless Ilium, seeming to feel this blow with flaming top stoops to his base and with hideous crash take, takes prisoner Pyrrhus' ear. So the whole city collapses um, and Pyrrhus pauses to watch it. 
Um, so his sword, which was declining on the milky head of Reverend, Reverend Priam, seemed in the air to stick. So Pyrrhus was standing there ready to do the killing blow, um, but he's so distracted by the city falling that he forgets to do anything there. So in that moment, he is um, like a neutral to his will and matter, did nothing. So he's um, neutral between his purpose, his will to kill Priam, and the fulfilment, the matter, the content of that wish. Um, and in a way, that's exactly the position that Hamlet is currently in. He's neutral between his will to get revenge and the actual act of getting revenge, which is killing Claudius. Um, but as we often see, against some storm, a silence in the heavens, the rack stands still, the bold wind speechless, and the orb below is hush as death, anon the dreadful thunder doth rend the region. So, after Pyrrhus's pause, aroused vengeance sets him new a work. So he's just saying, um, in the same way that uh, in the calm uh, before a storm, um, it, it, you end up with a worse storm from a moment of calm. In the same way, this moment where Pyrrhus has paused, it's made him actually angrier, and so he sets back to his vengeance with even stronger bloodlust and the desire for vengeance. Um, then he says, Never did the Cyclops' hammers fall on Mars's armour forged for proof eternal with less remorse. Um, then Pyrrhus's bleeding sword now falls on Priam. So Pyrrhus finally kills um, Priam. So here we have just had um, the enactment of um, a revenge, a son taking revenge successfully. <coughs> so then the player who is speaking is Aeneas, who is um, actually um, Priam's grandson. So he's blaming fortune for Priam's death. So he says, Out, out, thou strumpet fortune. All you gods in general sin and take away her power. So he's asking the other gods to um, strip fortune of her power. Break all the spokes and fellies from her wheel. Um, and bowl the round knave down the hill of heaven, lowers to the fiends. So again, in the same way that Hamlet has just called um, fortune strumpet, now the actor as Aeneas has called fortune strumpet as well. So Aeneas is railing against the concept of fortune, saying that it should be brought down. Um, Polonius interrupts at this point and says this is too long. Um, and then Hamlet says, um, okay, well then, player, move on to the part where he starts talking about Hecuba. So the player presumably skips a whole chunk of the speech and moves on. Hecuba is um, the wife of Priam, so that puts her in the same position as Gertrude. So the fact that her... Um, the fact that Hamlet wants to hear about Hecuba suggests that he is still um, preoccupied with Gertrude and her position, more so than even um, Claudius and the fact that he was the one who actually got that, did the killing of King Hamlet. Um, so basically, the Queen has been running barefoot up and down, threatening the flames um, with you know stuff on her head instead of the diadem and instead of wearing a fancy robe she's just got a blanket because um, she's caught it up in the middle of the night um, and when um, when people saw her you know this beautiful amazing queen who had done so much now brought so low where she's only got a blanket around her and she's all a mess and she's running around the bloody streets in bare feet um, so he's saying that anyone who saw her would against fortune's state pronounced um, treason um, so anyone who saw the queen like this would have railed against fortune as being unfair and unworthy so again we've got this really strong theme um, of seeing fortune as being something that is completely unreasonable and unfair and that needs to be brought down um, it's coming out very strongly in this first part of the play um, basically and she was really upset with the death of Priam um, and so Polonius comments that the actor has turned his colour and has tears in his eyes. Um, so this description tells us how the actor appears. Um, and Hamlet says, that was great. Oh, I'd like to hear you say the rest of the speech again later. Um, and then he asks Polonius to make sure that the actors are well settled and that they have a place to sleep and that they're looked after. Um, and Polonius replies, I will use them according to their desert, so I'll give them what they deserve. And Hamlet says, no, treat them much better. He says, if you use every man the way that he deserves, who should escape whipping? So this indicates his really low opinion of mankind, if he thinks that um, all men really deserve to be whipped. Um, 
So he says, use them after your own honour and dignity. The less they deserve, the more merit is in your bounty. Take them in. So he's saying they might not deserve to be treated well, but if you treat them well anyway, then that's to your credit and and it it will be good for you. Um, So then Polonius goes out with them, except for the first player who stays behind. And Hamlet says... um, do you know the murder of Gonzago? And the player says, yes. And Hamlet says, I'd like, to, I'd like you to perform that tomorrow. Um, and I'd like to add in maybe 12 or 16 lines um, into that play. And the actor says, sure, I'm happy to do it. Um, and then the player goes out. Um, and then he says goodbye to Rosencrantz and Guildenstern as well. And then Hamlet is left alone in order to give his second soliloquy. Now, again, we'll go through this soliloquy in a lot more detail in class, so I'm just going to basically talk about what he's actually saying. So he says, Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. So I'm so pathetic. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, can force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all his visage waned, tears in his eyes, distraction, a broken voice, and his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit, and all for nothing, for Hecuba. So how can this this actor make his face pale, bring tears to his eyes, and look completely upset, all as an act, over Hecuba? What's Hecuba to him, or he to Hecuba, that he should weep for her? What would he do had he the motive and the cue for passion that I have? He would drown the stage with tears and cleave the general ear with horrid speech, make mad the guilty and appall the free, confound the ignorant and amaze indeed the very faculties of eyes and ears. So he's saying, imagine what this actor, who can pretend to be this upset about something that's not real, imagine what he would do if he actually had the same cause for emotions as I do. Um, He would, you know, tell everybody what had happened and he'd ruin things for everybody else. And he says... Yet I, a dull and muddy metalled rascal, peak like a John of Dreams, um, unpregnant of my cause and can say nothing. I can't speak or act, he's saying. No, not for a king, upon whose property in most dear life a damned defeat was made. Um, so I can't do it, even though it's my father, a loved, a loved father, a loved king, who was treated completely dishonourably. I have the best reason in the world, and I can't speak out or act out how I really feel about it. And he says, am I a coward? Who calls me villain, breaks my pate across, plucks off my beard and blows it in my face, tweaks me by the nose, gives me the lie in the throat as deep as to the lungs? Who does me this? So he's saying, um, what's wrong with me? The only explanation is um, that I'm a coward. So he's saying the only the only possible reason for me to be this um, this unable to express my true feelings and to talk about what's happened is that I must be a coward. So he said, God's wounds, swounds, I should take it for it cannot be, but I am pigeon livid and lack gall to make oppression bitter. Or before this, I should have fatted all the region's kites with this slave's offal. So um, the only explanation is that I am a coward, otherwise I would have fed this guy's guts to the birds before now. And then he gets distracted and he says, bloody bawdy villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain, oh vengeance. So he's, he's started thinking about Claudius and he goes off to um, sort of insult Claudius um, there. And then he says, why, what an arse am I? This is most brave that I, the son of a dear father murdered, prompted to my revenge by heaven and hell, must, like a whore, unpack my heart with words and fall a-cursing, like a very drab, a scullion. So he says, oh, how pathetic am I? I'm standing here talking about Claudius and all I can do is call him names and curse. I am, I'm not able to act upon it. And then he says, fire upon it, foe, about my brain. So he says, look, I've got to change the topic. I've got to move on. And he says, I have heard that guilty creatures sitting at a play have, by the very cunning of the scene, been struck so to the soul that presently they have proclaimed their malefactions. So he says, I've heard that sometimes people who are, like guilty people who are watching a play that has the same crime that they've committed in it, um, have um, admitted their crime as a result of watching the play. He says, murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. So he's saying, you can't help but confess to to murder, even if you don't actually say anything. You can't hide that. It's something that changes who you are, so you can't hide it. 
And he says, I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tempt him to the quick. If he but blench, if, he's, if, he fa- if his face changes colour, goes pale, I know my course. He says, the spirit that I have seen may be the devil, and the dev- devil has power to assume a pleasing shape. Yeah, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, abuses me to damn me. So he's saying, look, um, I know that guilty people often react when they see a play where the same crime is being committed. I'm worried that the ghost that I've seen is actually not really the ghost of my father, that my father wasn't really murdered and that it was all made up to tempt me because I am weak with, with grief. Um, and so he says, I'll have grounds more relative than this. I'm going to have a reason that is um, more trustworthy than just a ghost telling me something. And he says, the play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. So the play is how I'm going to find out what's really going on. And with the end of that soliloquy is the end of Act 2.